Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for coming over to hear a lecture and demonstration given by Irene Kennedy. And she came from far distance away in New Jersey and to give us free lecture and demo. Thank you very much. You're welcome. She participated in one of our shows in the past, Togetherness Oneness, and we purchased her wonderful egg temper paintings, which is on display. So she offered us three lectures some time ago at the end of the World Salon Show, because ending the Salon Show, Salon Show to celebrate something very unique. So this has happened to be the perfect time. But unfortunately, today it's not really, the weather is not pleasing. So you can see not too many people are here. And tomorrow, the weather is much better. So they are coming to pick up their artworks. Isn't that sad? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I was expecting. We did promote through social oh, media. Oh, realize that you were changed it, yeah. Heaven's sakes. And sometimes <laughs> unexpected things happen up in the heaven and then give us little tears. And <laughs> <laughs> so we tasted a little bit of tears, but here we are having wonderful exhibitions of the 24th annual Salon Show, as you can see, beautifully displayed, beautifully done by the members, 58 artists this year are members of the World Salon on the 24th anniversary. So, as you might have read about her background, Eileen Kennedy's background, would you like to say briefly about your background? Oh, okay. So, um, I've been painting most of my life. I'm now in nearly 70. <laughs> and um, I actually did my undergraduate, uh, I did a BFA at Pratt Institute back in the 70s, lived here in Brooklyn um, for a number of years. It stayed on after I graduated. Um, of course, at that time, I came out of um, Pratt as an abstract artist. I was making large um, uh, three-dimensional wall constructions out of uh, balsa wood, handmade Japanese paper, and watercolor. But even though it was like very, they were like, you know, and they were modular, they were made of like cubes. Um, and I put them all together with glue and pins, and I had my little miter saw. And, um, but it was still, even though, even though it was like a much larger uh, medium, it was um, uh, still very meticulous. It was uh, sort of like the same approach that you take to temper of many, many, many layers. You know, I live with a hairdryer attached to my, my hand to dry, you know, dry the different layers. I, you know, I was lucky enough to be in a show at the Brooklyn Museum, like <laughs> next to Judy Chicago's dinner party. <laughs> In, in the next room, uh, in like around 1980, I think. But I really missed um, narrative. I missed drawing. Uh, as many art students, that's what brings us to um, to go to art school in the first place. Is that we're good at drawing? Um, and so I started like taking like life classes on the side. I was working in the city, midtown, like just doing temp jobs, and I would go to the art students' league at night and uh, pick up, you know, uh, pick up my drawing skills. Um, and then I just started studying like old master techniques, sort of thing they just didn't teach in art school in those days. You know, there was, we had a, we had a great drawing program at Pratt, great anatomy program, great, you know, painting program, but no one ever like taught you how to do it. You know, it was just, just go do it. It wasn't, this is how you apply paint. You know, we learned color theory, we learned, you know, we did, but we didn't really learn mixing paint from anyone. We sort of had to like pick that up. But there, but then there I was up at Columbia Medical School drawing from cadavers. I mean, they had a fabulous anatomy program at that time. So um, I had to find books that, you know, of course there was no internet in those days. So it was like, you had to really scrounge to find things out. 
And um, I had been introduced to the work of George Tucker um, in around 1976. Um, he's like a was a, a social he's a social realist uh, temper painter who who was very active like through the, the 50s and 60s, all doing various classical. Uh, representational paintings during the time of the, of the abstract expressionist movement and i really was so enamored of the look you know just how those that paint looked different from oil paint and it looked different from anything i had ever seen and um so you know i i picked up what books i could find there was no one there to teach it to me at the time i bought the um you know, I bought some pigments, I read up on it, then I started reading about the kind of panels you had to make because you couldn't use acrylic gesso. So I, as soon as I saw a double boiler and blah, 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 I said, that's it. You know, so I became, I, I became an oil painter and I did large figurative life scale, life scale um, multi-figure paintings. And I was reasonably successful. I mean, um, you know, I lived in the city for a while, but then I moved uh, to New Jersey. I married and, you know, had a family, and, um, but I kept painting the entire time. So uh, really, really, you know, lar large works. Um, you know, I did get like a, a fellowship from the state, you know, got some recognition. In those days, the newspaper still had art reviewers. Um, and so that, you know, I was, I could always get like a, a decent review in, in a paper. In fact, I became an art reviewer. I was an art reviewer for the Jersey Journal. It was part of the Jersey's, uh, the Jersey's uh, city uh, art scene back in the 90s. Um, did that for a couple of years. And then um, as, as life would have it, um, the little, little change came. I, I was divorced and, um, you know, became a single mother and I had to go get like a full-time job. Um, but um, one of those, one of the benefits of that was um, I got paid vacations, which I had never had in my life. There I was, almost 50, never had a paid vacation. And so I did some, and we had the internet, so I did some research and so I want to give that egg tempera a try. You know, and this was uh, about 12 years ago. And um, so I uh, went on a workshop on an island in Maine for like three days, kind of learned how to just mix the paint and handle it. Came back for a couple of years, made some paintings, then studied with another, that was with Phil Shermer. He's an amazing tempera painter. Uh, up in Maine, uh, and then I studied with Ku Shadler, who is uh, she. She wrote the book that I'll be showing you later, and um, and I just started working in tempera, and uh, I never looked back. I never went back to oil. So, like basically, the hardest the hardest transition for me was the scale because it's so labor intensive. I mean, this is very large for a tempera painting. Most people are working on like nine by 12, like little pieces. I mean, Wyeth and you know, others do do larger ones, but you're, it's, it's like a four to five month time investment to, to, have, to do a painting like that, uh, which you'll understand once I get into the details. But as, as a corollary you know, to that, um, um, even when I was doing oil paintings, I, I, I still just love to just draw. So I did, um, I always did a full scale finish, highly finished drawing of like whatever painting I was doing because if they were multi-figure pieces, you know, they were like people posing like at different times in different settings and I sort of, you know, put them all together and I had to integrate a background, you know, that, that sort of thing. So I, I, there was always a lot of pre preparatory drawing. My oil work was like, I, I did underpaintings, I did glazes, I did, you know, all that stuff. Um, so I, you know, I was prepared to do that for tempera, but to, to, you know, I had to bring it down, you know, down to size. And then, but I did, I was looking, you know, I was still using, I was, I used to use like Prismacolor, like the terracotta pencil. So it looked like the Renaissance chalk, but you could get, get like a much finer detail. Um, and so I was doing that, but then I realized that a lot of the tempera people that I was running into, because um, there's like a Facebook group and it's tempera painters from all over the world. And we all like trade tips and, um, you know, give, uh, you know, when we have a new piece done, we post it, curators go in and curate, you know, shows out of that. Um, and, um, and 
by the way, too, I have a handout that is here for everyone at the end and any of the sites that I mentioned or books or whatever, all, or all that info information is on here. So you'll be able to take that home with you if you have any interest in pursuing it further. Um, a lot of the people were doing silver point drawing and I knew silver point, you know, like I did, I had to take a materials course at Pratt and we did like, we did very contemporary materials, but we also did very antique and silver point is, is part of the sub, there's a major um, you know, category of metal point because you can draw with silver, you can draw with gold, you can draw with copper, you can draw basically with any, you know, any metal um, on any surface that has enough tooth. Um, and by tooth, I don't mean like watercolor paper that has tooth, I mean uh, on a microscopic level um, that has a substance harder than silver. If, if any of you remember your, um, your Mohs scale from uh, Earth Science um, that's, that measures hardness, um, when you, uh, you want to do silver point, you, you can't draw on just a plain piece of paper. It has to be coated with something that contains an element that's harder than silver. So it will, you know, abrade the silver and leave a mark. So, for example, acrylic gesso has titanium white in it. Titanium is harder than silver. It's a, it's a good substance. Then, like, I can also use the same uh, gesso that I make uh, for my like, tempered panels, which is made of uh, rabbit skin glue, and I use marble dust as my white whitener, um, and that, that gives a nice uh, thing, too. Um, and then there are other uh, manufacturers, there's sort of a, a renewed interest in metal point, so they're making like new um, things, like Golden's has a silver point ground, um, which I, I've tried them all, so, and I'll get more into that. So what I want to do is go into a little bit of the history of it, so silver point as, as a writing method was like used like since uh, people started writing because when they you know used to take animal skins and and you know prepare them they usually coated them with some kind of coating to make it smoother and they would use like a, a metal some metal implement it might not have been silver to to write but it really wasn't it became prevalent as a drawing. Um, material like in the medieval times it has been used in illuminated manuscripts and um, as a drawing uh, method but then in the early in 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 the, uh, the the renaissance like in the 1400s so i'm going to pass around some examples of um, of of drawings that most of these were actually in um i believe it was 2016 um, part of the renewed interest was because the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. did a huge survey show of uh, metal point drawing, uh, and they brought silver point and metal point drawings from all over the world that have never been seen together, have never been out of their, you know, libraries or, you know, archives or wherever they were, and it was called uh, Drawing in Silver, Silver and Gold from Leonardo to Jasper Johns. And uh, they produce a beautiful catalog. If anyone has any interest in the history of and you know all the materials and, and whatever, but with the most beautiful examples, that's a great book. That was the catalog. So I did get to see that show of uh, a whole people, a bunch of people that were on the um, uh, on that Silver Point Facebook page, all got together and met in Washington D.C. when the authors were giving. Um, a talk, and they saved like the, fr the, the front rows for us, <laughs> and we were like VIPs. But um, so here is, um, uh, I'll, I'll just stay sitting down, and then I'll pass it around. So this is um, this is from the, the this this is uh, like in the mid 1450s. This is a silver point drawing, and by um, from someone in the circle of uh, Van der Weyden. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful drawing, and when, when I pass it around, you will see that it's sort of like a rich, sort of red-brown color, and the beauty of silver is that, just like with jewelry and silverware, it tarnishes with exposure to the atmosphere. Uh, gold, people draw with gold, um, they'll draw, pure silver does not tarnish, but sterling silver does, because it has this 
a, a minute element of copper or copper in it, and that's what makes it turn. I, and that's why I stick with just sterling silver because um, I love the 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 what happens the, the the patina that it acquires over time. Yes. Do you draw on a white surface? Is the silver, can you see it as silver, or do you have to wait for the patina to happen? And how long does the patina take to happen? It's, it's very um, nebulous. Um, I can see a change from one day to the next um, because it comes out dead, dead cold gray. It looks like a 9H graphite pencil, but I can see the portions that I worked on the day before have already warmed up. It depends on whether you frame it right away. It depends on how humid the air is. It depends on what's in your atmosphere, and it and and, and a host and some and I believe, although some people swear it has no effect, but I have found a difference depending on the coating that I use on my paper. And I'll, I'll get into like you know what the what those options are. Um, of course, back in the Renaissance, they were relying on uh, candlelight and daylight. So um, I think there was a lot, of there, and sulfur is one of the things that, um, that causes it to turn more quickly. In fact, people do take like little, like they take liver of sulfur that jewelers use to tarnish a silver jewelry, and um, they'll put it in a little open thing and they'll put their drawing in a box. <laughs> but you can't control it. So uh, also fumes from garlic and onions can c cause it to turn because my, my teacher's um, husband was an organic farmer and she left some of her drawings like when he brought like in baskets and baskets of garlic and onions and, and her stuff like turned overnight. And, uh, but then, you know, it, and depending on what you use, sometimes it can have, it can go too far. And weird, weird things can happen. So, so yes. What fascinated you for, to begin with? You know, you must have done etching before, and then changed to silver point. What made you interested in that medium? Um, well, um, a lot of tempera painters. It was a tr tradition that many tempera painters did uh, their underdrawing on their panel in silver point because that's traditionally what was done they'll do a whole developed drawing with they'll build up the darks the, you know and the lights and uh, and also you know it because the the panel the material that the gesso that you make for tempera is an excellent a uh, substrate for uh, ex excellent ground for silver point um you know it will take and um and it doesn't smear that's one of the problems, you know, it's, it's kind of like drawing with ink. You can, you know, people say you can erase silver point, but it does, you know, whatever you do, you're going to abrade the surface somewhat. And if you're doing delicate work, it's going to look different on that spot where you, you did that. So if I'm doing something like a still life or whatever, I'll just sit and draw it. But if I'm doing a multi, you know, multi-figure composition, um, I, you know, I, I will work out the whole drawing on, on, on tracing papers and, and then transfer it onto my panel. But I, do, I really love that delicate, um, uh, that delicate line that you can get. And I do have some, I, I didn't bring any, um, except for I, I do have one small silver point drawing that I brought with me because of the weather, I didn't want to risk and plus, I have a, I actually have a solo exhibition up right now, and all my current stuff is in that. So if <laughs> tomorrow's the last day, otherwise I would have had more stuff with me. <laughs> um, but um, so this, so and and then on the other on the flip side of this is is a drawing of a soldier by Leonardo. Um, it's actually, I was surprised at how small it was because I had seen it in books, but when I actually, it's only, it's only like about that big, but, and I, excuse me, I just, I just read that this was most likely, um, like an assignment that he was given as a young artist when he was training, um, and that everyone would have had to, had to do this drawing and that you would have to like do this drawing before you could go to the next step. So I'm, I'm going to pass this around. And these are, these are both, um, 
the first one, they don't have an exact date, but it's between 1455 and 65, and this one is between 1475 and 80, so. And then, um, and then we have, of course, Durer. Um, Durer, Durer did a beautiful, beautiful uh, drawing here. It's a self-portrait at age 13. And again, the, it's, it's turned quite brown. Um, and, and then on the flip side, William Holman Hunt uh, in the 18, 1877. And Silver Point and, and Metal Point sort of follow the same trajectory as um, as Ed Kemper did. Uh, very, very popular in the in the early, you know, it was used in illum illuminations, you know, during the medieval time period, and then it became like the main uh, medium for panel painting um, in 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 the early Renaissance. But as oil paint came in. It you know, it was replaced with oil paint because the issue with um, tempera was that um, here I'll pass these around. The issue with tempera is that um, you cannot, you can't blend. So when you when when you make a mark, if you look at this painting when you have some time later closely, it's made up of thousands and thousands of little marks made with the tip of my. Um, my a watercolor brush, basically. Um, once you, you make a mark on your panel, it is dry to the touch. So there is no blending, you know, for doing flesh tones and turning a form or, or anything like that. It is all done optically by transitioning color and, and value. Uh, it's, it's sort of pen, like pen and ink, pen and ink, uh, in color. <laughs> so, but, um, and then, then I will pass around um, some uh, samples of my own. For, for the most part, these, these that are coming around, except for the very last one that has a very greenish cast, these are, these are, are, are photos of silver point drawings that I did, and they're like 18 by 24. Um, it's temporary. Water based? Is that water yes, based? it's water and um and it's egg yolk and, and water and pigment. So uh, can I ask why what it was that attracted you from you were working in oils previously, correct? What was it that attracted you <coughs> to switch? To um something? so it seems very right. I, I always wanted to, to to try it, but also I have a very I, I'm just, I have a very linear style. Uh, my, my paintings were more about drawing than they were, and I, and I was very criticized a lot in the, in the press. <laughs> you know, like, oh, you know, her drawings are great, but her paintings look like colored drawings, you know, like a coloring book, because no matter what I did, you know, it's still, they, 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 they were still flat, because I, I was so, I was really into more into the design like more like the formal concerns um even though i was doing a lot of detail and that sort of thing you know there was like a lot of um you know that's what i was interested in and then uh, i love the luminous quality that you could get with this paint um with the layering that you do so um, this is a, a portrait of my sister um when she was going through a bad time um and then this this is an actual um, this is an actual silver point drawing. It's done, the last one the the, the nude. Um, I just did that in like a life class. I, I do life drawing like once a week. Um, like we we'll, we'll just get together and, and hire a model. Uh, but for a while, I there's a paper called Terra Skin paper. I don't know, I have some samples of it. I don't have the the pad with me though. Um, that is made, the paper itself is made of calcium carbonate and a little bit of resin. So because of that, it's, it's hard enough to let silver leave a mark and you don't have to coat the paper. So, um, but it turns very greenish as you could. So that's an actual silver point drawing rather than a photograph of one. So, um, 
So the whole, um, the, um, so if, like as I said a little bit before, the issue with silver point is you can, you can use any substrate. You can use um, paper, you can use board, you can use wood, but whatever you use, it has to be coated with something uh, that has an element in it that is hard, you know, harder than silver. Um, so acrylic gesso is fine. You could put a couple of coats of acrylic gesso on a piece of museum board and you can just start drawing. Now, how smooth you want it, um, you know, that's up to your individual style. Uh, you can sand it, you can do whatever. So when I first started, I, I've tried everything, believe me, I've tried everything. <laughs> I, um, because I was just sort of playing around with it. So um, when, I, when I first did it at Pratt Institute, I still have somewhere, I have like their little abstract drawings that I did of, um, and I used uh, what, uh, Chinese white uh, gouache uh, because it has zinc in it. So that that gave a really nice, you know, finish to it. And then when I started doing uh, this, I did, uh, I tried silver, I tried, um, I've done some pieces on uh, with acrylic gesso, and then I tried um, Golden's makes a silver point ground that, you know, it's a, it says it's self-leveling, which means if there are brush marks, it like, they, they, they flatten out so you're not drawing over brush marks. I tried that. Um, I found that had like a rubbery feel to it. And, and the, the, the most, the thing that you're looking for, silver point by nature, or metal point, gold point, whatever you're using, it's a narrow, it has a much narrower value range than say graphite or charcoal. It's very, very hard to get dark darks. Um, I have, let me just grab this, this one here. I'll pass this around and you promise not to put your fingers, fingers on it. But this is just a little, this is a little study that I um, was doing for a piece I'm working on now. So these are red-winged blackbirds um, in uh, Phragmites, <laughs> in the weeds. Um, but you can see how dark, that's about as dark as I could get. And you, you don't get darker by um, pressing hard. You press a little harder than normal on your initial layer, but you get darker by building up layers. Because um, if, especially if you're working on a, a piece of board, um, Arches used to make this awesome. Um, it was hot press watercolor paper already mounted on illustration board, and then they were bought, and then they stopped making it. And I was in the middle of like a series, uh, and uh, luckily, I mean, I had some like pieces hanging around, but I had to find something else. And but you could you could use um, mason like the whatever the equivalent of masonite is today, and. Um, this uh, that I'm using is a, um, there, there's an um, outfit like right here in Brooklyn called Art Boards. Art, they make art, it's called Art Boards Gesso. They make their own gesso, their own formula. It is incredibly smooth. And they'll make these panels. They'll only go up to 18 by 24. Like when, when I was doing the, um, the, the silver point drawing for, for that piece, that's, that's 24 by 30. And um, they wouldn't go that big, so. Um, but it is it is beautifully smooth and it, it's it's nice and hard. You know, there's no it, the the silver point tool doesn't incise like you know into the um you know into it at all. When you're working on paper, you have to be careful. Um, you know that you're not pressing down hard. And w one thing I do like when I if I do a when I do a workshop, you know, I'll have my students like pull. You know, I'll put the um, the the silver wire will be in mechanical pencil. And I'll have them pull it out, like so it's out that far. And if it's dead soft, like sterling, it will bend if you press too hard. So you know they'll wreck their silver if they if they're not careful. So um, so I'll I'll pass this around. What kind of materials do you use on the board? So, so, so that board, that board, that's one of the art boards, gesso, that comes already, already made. Mm -hmm. um, 
Unfortunately, they're, they're not making egg tempera panels. <laughs> so. What about um, the, the painting behind? Uh, yeah, same, I'll, same. I'll, I'll cover that when I get to the tempera part, because yeah. yeah. I, I have all the examples yeah. of that too. So, mm -hmm. so what I'm going to show you now are what the tools look like. So. Um, So I've brought a number of tools that I routinely use. Um, I'll show you this one first, because this is the coolest thing. So this, um, there was a man, Gavin Gardner, of course I found him online. Um, he, he makes all sorts of little artist things. So there are a number of Renaissance and early Renaissance um, drawings and, and showing. Um, people drawing with silver styli, and this is a solid silver sterling styli. Like he copied it from one of those paintings, and he he cast, he made a mold, and he cast them, and he polished them, and um, and I just bought one, and I really it, for certain things, especially when I'm holding, um, you can hold it on the side and make, you know, make marks just like you know you can with a pencil. But then there, um, what I use the most are. Um, I did, it's a very thin, very thin piece of silver, um, and I will show you. You can go to a jeweler and just say, you know, I want this gauge, that gauge. You could look at their wire. They all have it on spools or, or whatever, and, you know, you can buy it. But then there are art supply stores that, you know, that sell it. Um, they, they come in little, uh, little tubes like this, and um, this, is a, this is a thick one, a thick sterling. Um, it's like $11 for a piece of silver, and it lasts a really long time. I mean, I do really large work, so, but it will last me maybe one or two, one or two, like, pieces that size. Um, because what happens is, it, you know, it gets too short for the mechanical pencil, but then you can, for, for the first, like, two years I did this, I, I still had the one I made one in 1975 when I was at, at art school, and I, I just had a piece of dowel and I masking taped it to a piece of dowel. You know, it's just like other people drill a hole in a piece of dowel and insert it. You could, you know, do what do do whatever you want. Um, I don't have a piece here with me because I don't really use it, but um, they make um, it's like steel wool, but it's copper. So if you want to tone like a whole area, you can take you know take that and like. Do, do the do the surface, um, and but you can basically draw with anything. There's a guy. He's a, he's on the silver point uh, group that we're in. He he makes really large silver point drawings with pots. You know, he like throws pots on it and makes like big marks. And you know, he has the treated paper on the ground, and 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 he always like makes a video because it's really noisy. <laughs> But people, you could draw with a coin. You could draw, draw with your jewelry, uh, with your with your silverware, what, whatever, uh, anything that you know is metallic. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm I'm a little confused. How when you draw with whatever you use, whether it's the silver or the wire, how does it the the when you draw, how does the impression come off? It's it's the same as if you were drawing with graphite. Um, but you've coded it. Remember, I discussed like the coding that you have to have. That it leaves a mark. And I actually have brought samples of the Terra Skin paper and extra styli. So anybody that wants to come up and get a piece and sit in their seat and give it a try, you're welcome to try it. So uh, I personally don't really care for that paper, uh, but it's great for like just doing sketches and practicing and you know that that sort of thing. So. Um, but, um, and so the, dif the, different, um, the different substrates will provide, give you different, like whatever, the, whatever you use to, to paint your paper or your board with, depending on what you use, um, depending on how hard the element is that's in it. So some people, like, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with natural pigments, 
you know, they, they're, they're on the West Coast, they're a company, they're emulating the old master paints. So there's like, their paints have like just oil and pigment, nothing else. None of the stabilizers or fillers, but they sell pigments, they sell all this stuff. They experiment with grounds. Um, they, they made a, a special silver point ground. They throw some extra stuff like silica and different different things in to make it harder. To, and I did find that I did get a, 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 a wider value range using that. Um, but once when I discovered these panels being made like right here, <laughs> and they'll mail them to me, um, uh, and they're and they're really I really get a decent um, range of value, and they're so beautifully smooth. It's the sanding that that you know that's great. You, you know the sanding is like you have to wear an N95 mask. I mean. I had N95 mask before COVID, so <laughs> it was like <laughs> for working with pigments and you know all this stuff. So, did you have a question? Just to chime off of that one, and it sounds like, I mean, obviously we haven't even gotten into the paint yet, but the reason for doing, you know, the sort of buggy drawing with silver, it sounds like it's A, because if you use the pencil, it would smudge and it would ruin the sort of Right. And B, because it, Get such a light, you know, sort of tone. Yes. You can, you know, sort of use it as, as really an underdrawing without affecting your. Right. Your it's work. it's very delicate. I don't use it as an underdrawing. I do because it takes me so long to do a painting, so long to do a drawing. If I can produce five pieces in a year, that's a lot. Um, so I I. I work out, if, if, if I was working from, if I went out and took a photograph and came in and just worked for that photograph, maybe I wouldn't go through all that trouble. But because I'm composing from disparate elements, um, I, I have to make up the lights, you know, when I photograph my, like my, my figures, um, you know, they might be photographed on a different day, but I try to do the same light type, of, you know, light direction at least. But then I have to like develop the light source myself, like make it have a uniform light source, like make that all happen. So it helps me to um, work out all those um, all those things um, beforehand before you start painting. Because again, tempera like silver point is not a forgiving medium. Like like oil paint, yeah, you want to move this hand over here, you know, you could paint over it up to a certain extent and you know move the hand, whatever. Here you're it's you're down to taking a razor blade and scraping it back down to the white and, and starting you know, and then you have to match all those layers that you've done and it's like a real pain. And I have I have done that. <laughs> but you know, because like it looked fine in the drawing, but once I got into painting, like the element of color is, you know, kind of intuitive. And so um, that's, and also a lot of us just do it because it's cool. <laughs> you know? it's, and it's, there's, but you know, it's, it's just like you get like a different, we're, we're all kind of nerds, you know, we're materials nerds. Like, like um, my teacher that, that I studied temper with, she's really gotten into silver point now, and um, she's writing another book. She's writing a book on silver point, but you know she she has all these people she knows. She knows people at the Smithsonian. She knows people at Harvard. She knows you know all the paint manufacturers. She'll call them up. What do you think about the, if we did you know? And so um, she she really you know goes the extra mile to find out like if it's archival, is it gonna last? But I just I just love the surface. I mean, I just finished a, a painting um, and a drawing, and um, it's if if you go on my website or on Instagram, you'll be able to find it. It's pic, it's it's called Picnic, but the silver point drawing something happens, and it just turned this like. In less than a month, in a couple of months, it turned this beautiful, warm silver, and I, I don't have anything that turned that like that, and, and I don't know why. So, and that's the problem. <laughs> but I, one of the things is I left it out. I usually get it framed right away, and then I sit, put it in front of my paint painting, and work from it when I'm painting. But this time I didn't have time, and so it might be just because I left it out. I didn't frame it for a while, so that's, yes. Yeah. 
those mediums were used during Renaissance and then died off. Yes. Oh, I, I should go into that. When did, did it come back again? Yeah. Uh, I'm very curious. Sure. Who, who started doing it among contemporary artists? Okay. So it, it sort of just disappeared. Um, uh, tempera sort of disappeared from, like, from the face of the earth, um, except for icon painters. Uh, icon painters are still using it, but you know they were sort of like in their own little world. Um, you know, no one could like find you know find them. <laughs> and um, in uh, the 19th century, uh, middle class British people started traveling a lot, and they went to Italy. They went to um, uh, you know, they went to Italy and they saw all these panel paintings that they had never seen. And, you know, maybe they had seen them in plates, in books, but they were black and white. And, you know, you couldn't tell them from oil paint or, or whatever. And they became very, very interested. And then, so someone, someone trans translated uh, this book. So some of you may have read this book for other, other reasons. So this is uh, Cinino Cinini's uh, Il Libro dell'Arte. And it is like a guide for artists written in the 1300s. And it um, goes into everything from how to make brushes, how to make egg temper paint, how to do silver point, how to do every, you know, everything. And so, because no one knew how they, how they made those paintings, because there was no one around to tell them. So when this book got translated uh, into English, and um, people started experimenting with it. So in Great Britain, um, in in the in the mid uh, in the 1800s, they they actually formed an egg temper society, and um, and actually I think recently it might even still be up there. Forget the name of the library. There's a library on in California that actually has an exhibition with a lot of the paint, these British painters at temper paintings. The only thing is, is that they probably like didn't get this, but they, they painted them on canvas. But they're, they're quite small, so which could be why they don't have problems. But um, temper is a brittle medium, and that's why you never paint it on canvas. Uh, it's always paint, painted on board, so so it became very very popular, and then and then I guess you know it was sort of like kind of subsided. It was sort of like a phase that that people went through, and then um, in um, in the 1950s uh, there was Daniel V. Thompson. Uh, I believe he was he was teaching at. Um, I can't remember. I think I thought it was Yale, but it might have been it might have been Harvard. Oh no, this is Yale, Yale University Press. Um, so he, I believe, he was teaching art history, but then he taught a course in uh, the practice of tempera painting, and so and he wrote this book based on the sections from this book that dealt with egg tempera, but it was sort of modernized like a little bit. But that was the 1950s, so. It, and, and not much has changed until you know until now because the materials are pretty much the same. Um, it's um, and that's where uh, George Tooker learned learned from him, and and Jar and Paul Cadmus was a temper painter, and Jared French. They were like a group that sort of paint, painted together and exchanged information. And, and Tooker, you know, they, they, they kind of remained faithful to that. Cadmus did a lot of drawing, too. Um, and then at some point, um, at some point, Wyeth started working in tempera. Andrew Wyeth worked in egg tempera as well. Um, and now today, um, I, I'm not, so, so these people were around. And so there's a painter in, in New Mexico, Michael Burt. He, he does amazing, um, Tempera paintings. He does a lot of gilding, like he gilds the background and then puts his figures like you know into it. But he 
he, he's the same age as I am, and he was in New York in the 70s, but he was working with Paul Cadmus. So Paul Cadmus was his mentor. So he learned like from him. And then, then there were different people around the country. So Ku Shather that I studied with, she, had, she was an art history uh, te uh, major. She became a furniture maker. She lived in Florence for a number of years. But then she decided to become a painter and she took to egg tempera. So they formed an American society of te egg tempera painters, which is, was really going up until like the early, early to right around the time I started doing it, they said it's too much work to keep the website going. So they didn't do it anymore, but there's a, a wealth of information there. So then they all give workshops. So there was Ted Wessel up in, uh, at the Hartford Art School. Um, he, he's a temper painter. And so they're, they're kind of like all, you know, all over the country. But because of the, uh, the internet, we're able to be in touch with each other and find out what's going on and, um, and, and find out about advances. Um, I just wonder how, how many people belong to the member of the temper Silver Point. Do you know? How many people are doing yeah, it? Yeah, how many members? Um, I, no, I don't. I don't. Mm -hmm. but, but what what I see though, um, because it's out there, uh, and because of the internet, you know, we post our work and other people see it, and then people say, oh, I want to find out about that, and so now, and now there are books out about it uh, that you can, um, what happened to the, to the other book? Mm -hmm. Oh, here it is. So because of that interest, um, Susan Schwab, who lives here in the city, um, she's an abstract um, artist, works in Metal Point. This, this cover is one of hers. So one thing about Silver Point is you don't have to work on a white ground. You can tone your grounds. You could tone your grounds like a pale color. And then, then, you know, to get your really light lights, you know, you have to heighten it with, say, like a little brush and tempera. Or you can work on a very dark ground, like she has, like, on, on this cover. And when you work on a dark ground, you see the intrinsic color of the metal more clearly than you do when you work on white. So, like, if you work in gold point on, um, on a white ground, it, it looks kind of like gray, maybe a little warm. Silver looks gray, copper looks gray, you know, it all looks gray, but it ultimately will tarnish to different, the ones that tarnish will tarnish. But she, she does these on, you could see gold is gold, copper is copper. Um, so you can work, I've seen beautiful works done on um, like a navy, a, a navy ground, and you just, you just get t uh, gesso that's, that, you, know, you get black gesso or, or navy gesso, or you, you can get dispersions and color your gesso, you know, the, whatever you want. And it's interesting, when you're working on, that, when you're working on um, a light ground, like I do, uh, you know, you're working from light to dark. So, you know, the more, more silver you apply, the darker it is. It's the opposite when you're working on a dark ground. If I did the same drawing, um, you know, on a dark ground, the, the, the more you know, you're working toward light, so the more silver, the lighter it is in contrast to the dark ground. There are a lot of different things that you can do with it. I'll pass this book around. This is an excellent book, a lot of resources in it, um, and a lot of, a lot of different artists. Um, and I also know that Ku Shadler is working on a book now. It should be out in 24, 2024. It'll probably be on the same scale as her temper book. Um, so um, so that, that is sort of, you know, the, the, the story on, on Silver Point. And as I said, if anybody wants to try it, do you want to take a little break and people can come up and grab um, grab a piece of paper and a silver point stylus and, um, and give it a try. If anybody wants to do that, we'll, you know, I'll let you do that and I'll get set up for the tempera portion. Um, if not, I'll just continue. So, no, no huh? I, I like it. I like it. You want to try it? Okay. Yeah. of the um, of that terra skin paper that I was talking about. And here 
see how old it is. I did it in 2016. Um, it was really for an oxidation check, test and also to see the value range that I could get from using different grounds. And it has the, um, the ground written on it and, and I, I drew them all at the same time. So I'll pass this around. I'll shoot. No, they just did it. Yeah, so that's that's from art boards in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. And you can buy the gesso. I mean, it's really made for oil painters, you know, and, and acrylic painters, but it works great for silver point. Yeah, so. Um, pardon me? Um, uh, what, two weeks ago? Yeah. Yeah, I'm working on a piece now that has um, a bunch of uh, uh, people crabbing. We used to go crabbing. I live near the Navasink River down on the Red Bank, and um, so, but the red winged blackbirds are always in the in the rushes there. <laughs> It could take a while, I think, and it just depends on. I find that in the higher humidity, it goes faster. And then, and you know, you're all welcome to take your drawing home with you, but I'll need the stylus back <laughs> for <laughs> future use. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I'll probably be, I think I'm going to be doing a Silver Point workshop um, later this year, but down in New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. It's too hard for me to schlep everything here. <laughs> I'm gonna, you, if you're drawing, just continue. Uh, I'm gonna move on to uh, egg tempera. I'm gonna show some samples of egg tempera painters. A uh, little bit about the history. Um, tempera, tempera paint is, um, it's been around for a very, very long time. There are actually, they've done some tests on some Fayum, uh, you know, Egyptian mummy uh, portraits. 
Um, they did find egg protein in some of them, but you know they can't like take them apart anymore, so they they can't really tell. Most of those were done with encaustic, um, but tempera became um, most prevalent. It was used in medieval times. It, it was um, for for manus manuscript painting. Um, they, I believe they use some other additives though because it's, it's quite brittle so if you turn pages you know it could crack um, so it became most prevalent in the in the early Renaissance uh, when for for panel painting um, and so as as I was discussing earlier usually they do an under an underdrawing um, and, and that could be why there are so you know there for some artists, there aren't like a lot of drawings like left. First of all, because the materials didn't last, but also if they did their drawings on the panel, um, they uh, and then they cover them with paint. You know, there's no 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 record of them. Um, so um, when it, when you look at these, you will see you will see the linear quality of, of these. Um, in fact, you can almost even see an outline on some of them. And um, so one, one that I'll be passing around is a Filippo Lippi um, from 1465. This is in the Uffizi. Um, and you'll get a closer look. But if you look really closely, uh, you, you can see, well, this has like a, a crackle like all over it. But, you know, you, you, you can't see the marks here. If you go online, you know, to, to, to the Google Art Project and where you can really, really zoom in, they put those incredibly high resolution um, examples of different, you know, paintings from different eras. You can zoom in and you can see that the brush marks. So, and then of course there's Botticelli, um, his, one of his panel paintings. Uh, even his famous paintings, we're, we're, we've been having a discussion, like we're not really sure like the famous birth of the birth of Venus is, we think it might be tempera grassa uh, because it's done on canvas and it's very large and we just think that if it was just pure egg tempera, it would have cracked by now, you know, it would have been much worse shape than it is now. Tempera grassa is basically egg, egg tempera, but you add a little bit of linseed oil to it. That's like, an, that's like its own whole different thing and you can, it still dries pretty quickly, but not as quickly as um, you know, as pure pure egg tempera, and you can blend a little better, and it probably gives it a little bit more flexibility. That gives the paint film more flexibility. So, but these are these are just you can see that it's you know, it's it's beautiful for um, linear linear work, and. And then, th that was like the mid 1400s. I don't have any of the English, uh, of those English paintings with me, if you know, from the, the, that 19th century era, but I do have a detail from Wyatt's uh, famous Christina's World, where you can see every blade of grass. Um, and this, believe it or not, this is 1948, that's quite far back. Um, and then, um, and then I have two two pieces uh, by George Tucker from the 50s, 1956. Famous one, Government Bureau. He was like, um, Big Brother is watching you. It was during the Cold War. A lot of anxiety. <laughs> And um, then um, I'll show you some of the people that I studied with. Um, Phil Shermer was the, the temper painter up in Maine that I mentioned. He mostly, he does portraits, but he mostly does incredible scenes of Maine. Um, and you know, like, and, and the, the, you know, shorebirds and, and, but it's amazing, like, you know, rocks and grass and it just, temper is made for it. And he gets that luminous quality of light from the many, many layers. But here is um, a, a portrait that he did. On, on one side is his portrait. It's called The Secret Gardener. Um, I don't know if those of you are aware of it, the, the National Gallery, every three years, does a portrait, um, has a, a portrait um, competition. 
uh, called the Utuin Buchiver Award. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, but he was a finalist in that. And this painting, this is a painting of his neighbor. Um, that, that was, I actually went down to see the show when he did that. And then, um, and then uh, Ku Shadler, my, my teacher, she d does some unique approaches too. Her, she applies her temporal layers so thinly that there are no, you don't see any marks. You, there's just no marks to be seen. Um, so I'll pass those around. And then um, I have a couple of, of my own that are, um, one, is, one is 18 by 24, it's an early one. Well, like in this, I would have, I had the model, the model came and posed on my dining room table. And then I, you know, I drew from life and then um, this is called wetlands. So this is like the, 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 the freshwater wetlands where we used to play as kids. So it's all the jack of the pulpits and, um, and scone cabbage. And then on the other side is one that um, it's a little larger. It's um, called Dolanobis Pachem. It's, um, it was inspired by a piece, uh, the Ralph Vaughan Williams Choral Masterwork of that name. I was actually singing in a, in a choir that was singing that for the first time and it just kind of sent chills up my spine. It was an anti-war piece. So, so my, my question is, um, you take the photograph of the scene to begin with. No. Not just the imagination. N no, usually, usually it depends. I used to, um, the model, I would pose the model, and a lot of the, the, the backgrounds are from my memory. So, so I would look at field guides and whatnot to make sure I had the plant, you know, the details of the plant life correct. Um, and, or some, and sometimes I will, will go take a photo, but... Um, Something like that painting. Okay, painting. so for this one, this mm -hmm. one was done, it was done during the lockdown. So um, I just had this idea in my head. I, I worked in the environmental sector for like a number of years. We, we did like a lot of marine conservation. And like, so uh, bycatch was like a big thing, you know, like commercial fishermen that catch uh, uh, by accident catch uh, endangered fish or you know whatever along with what their actually their target is and I just played around with ideas like that and I was trying to get some models to pose but I couldn't so I just drew them out of my head so uh, you know I, I studied enough and you know and to get people to hold a pose like that you know was and by then I couldn't get models to come we all had to stay in our house so I, 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 I have pages and pages in my sketchbook of trying to work out that composition. And um, so I, I do a lot of prep, prep work. So like you can see that the, that the water is purposely very stylized. Um, it's not, it doesn't look real, but you know, but I very, you know, I, I, I knew I wanted a certain kind of fish. So I, I found the fish with, um, the best pattern <laughs> you know, on it. So those are Atlantic cod, and I wanted it to be from the North, at North Atlantic, Mid-Atlantic, so that's that. And uh, so, um, yeah, so um, often I don't have, th that's why I do the preparatory drawing, because I don't have like a single source to work from. You know, I have to put it together. Um, and I know a lot of, I mean, I'm not totally computer illiterate. I mean, I did work in the IT industry, but um, I never learned like Photoshop or any of those things. So I don't have the skill to be able to like, put it together that way, the way some artists do. But um, so, 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 those, so you can see that there, you know, those are very, very, very linear. So. Um, so I'm going to talk about the materials, the materials that we use. Um, so m most of you seem to be artists here, so you know you're familiar with the structure of paint, and you know that every paint has pigment and a binder. You know the pigment is the pigment, and the binder is the bind. You know oil paint is linseed oil, um, watercolor is gum arabic, and um, egg tempera is egg yolk. Um, it was used, it has a high fat content, that's what you don't use the white because that's brittle. 
Um, so you get, you know, you get rid of, you know, you get rid of the egg white, and then you then you add water. Egg but white. yes, <laughs> or I, egg white omelets. <laughs> so um, so um, one of the one of the things that kept me from trying egg tempera way back in the seventies was that making the panels was like such a pain in the neck. So. But when I went on the first workshop that I did, well, she gave us, <laughs> we got panels, all the materials come with the workshop. And then, um, and then you know, we were introduced to um, vendor. There was a, a company in, in New Mexico that was making panels suitable for egg tempered painters. And the thing was that every time some, they, they would decide they didn't want to do it anymore, my teacher, Ku, and some of the other big egg temper painters would would find somebody and strong arm them into starting taking over the company. <laughs> so that went on for about ten years, and uh, how I, and so I was using those uh, for and and they would do them. There were standard sizes, but then they would do custom sizes as long as you ordered like two or three. And I was just balking at like making my own. But then uh, someone took them over, and I started to get pinholes pinholes in. In the panels, and and that's like tiny from tiny, tiny little bubbles, and often that does not show up until you're like you know 20 layers of paint in, you know, when you're applying a dark color and you're seeing all little white spots like on somebody's hair, or, and there's like no way to get get rid of you know you're like there with like a tiny little brush trying to fill them in, and I finally bit the bullet and I went up to um, to another workshop that was going to teach that included how to make the panels. So the pa basically, um, so a lot of people use, um, it used to be called masonite. Masonite's no longer in business, but it's, it's, mason it's whatever masonite used to make, this, this kind of board. Um, you want untempered, whatever it is, not impregnated with oil because it, it's not good you know, to put your uh, cover on that. However, because I tend to work larger, I mean, I'll, I'll use these panels made from these, like if I'm working on a smaller scale, but once you get larger, you start to get warping, and then you have to cradle it, and you go through all this stuff. And, and so I started making mine on, um, on plywood, um, and I finally settled on bir uh, Baltic birch plywood. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll, I'll send a sample around if anybody wants to look at it. So it's really stable, really stable plywood. It has like eight plies, and the plies are solid. It's birch all the way through. It's not like junk, and they're beautifully finished. Like people make furniture out of this stuff and leave the edges because it's very cool looking. Um, the only thing is, if you're going to do a painting on wood, you can't just put your gesso on the wood, you, you uh, because the grain can telegraph through over time. So you have to affix like a, a, a layer of linen to it. So, uh, but. It's not, you're not, you don't want to be using like the linen that you stretch for your canvas, that's too thick. And even though you think it's really smooth, it has like little, you know, it's a natural substance, so it has like little bumps. And when you're trying to cover that with 11 layers of gesso, you know, it's like that little bump could be really annoying. So you're looking for like handkerchief linen. It's hard to find, because it's hard to buy fabric online and know what you're getting. And, and now all the fabric stores are starting to close, so it's like really kind of crazy. But I've got this, like, I've, this is actually a cotton linen blend. It doesn't have to be linen. It's just, but, so I got a cotton linen blend, and it's, it's very, very good. So, um, so what, what I have to do, there's like a whole, is this my little? Is that the combination of cotton and linen? Yes, it's cotton oh. and linen, yeah. Mm -hmm. So. So you're looking for like handkerchief linen, like that really fine uh, stuff. Um, and I just want to grab this little booklet that I made. So making a making a panel can take um, takes like a week. It takes a week, but um, you know every day there's like a little step that you do, and then. In, until the last day when you put all the gesso on. So like I make myself like uh, a little booklet, like with, with the first day, this, and I actually put the day of the weekend, I just print it off out of Word, and, um, and I have little check boxes so make sure I don't miss something, because if you miss something, it could be a mess. So, 
So what I, what I have to do is um, I make rabbit skin glue, um, and you've all heard about rabbit skin glue forever and ever. It's not really made from rabbits anymore. It's it's you know it's like collagen, like like from probably from cows, but um, it's very very pure, very fine. It's it's just this like granules. And it, there's directions, and, and you soak it in water overnight, and then it becomes like jello, like really stiff jello. And then, uh, but it, it doesn't, it's not liquid at room temperature. It's, um, you have to warm it up, and then you add a white whitening to it. And I don't have any with me. Uh, you can use like um, chalk, towel, uh, there's like, you know, there's a whole list of things. I use marble dust, white marble dust. It, it creates like a brilliant, um, a brilliant um, surface, and it's really hard, nice and hard. And um, so, uh, and there's like a recipe for that. So like, you know, you, you make you make the, um, the the rabbit skin glue. You put a layer on both sides of your panel. Then the next night, you soak this in in rabbit skin glue and put another layer here and then you can squeegee and put it on and that will all tighten up and dry overnight and then the next and then meantime you're like making your gesso and there's all like these little steps you know it's like um because it's like i think it's like because of the size of my panels it's like two two cups of rabbit skin glue to three cups of marble dust and so you have to add it very slowly so you don't get bubbles or you end up with those pinholes and then you let it sit overnight and then you have to and while you're doing this it's in a it's in like you don't keep it hot it's like in a double boiler but it's like on warm or it, like t it has to be you know can't be so hot that you can't put your hand into it or it'll break down the glue so there's like all these little things if anybody really wants to do it Koo's book has every little step in there and all the things that like to, to watch out for um, if you and you know need it. skin you have to dilute and then warm up with the yeah. hot plate right yeah and so that it becomes all right. smooth so you um, add you add the white the whitening to it whatever mm. you're using then you have to strain it I actually strain it I got this tip from somebody but I strain it through pantyhose and it's such a fine mesh, it really got rid of all the pinholes. Except I used to, you know, I used to work in an office, and I like have to go. I'd be cutting up my pantyhose, and then I wouldn't have anything to wear. <laughs> but it would be like, uh, but it really, really works really well. And then you let it set for a day or two, and then I put, I use it like eleven coats, and you have to do eleven coats on the front. But even this will warp. So like when I'm painting this, I'll, ha I'll watch it and it'll be like this and then I flip it over and then the next day I paint 11 coats on the back. I don't have to be as careful. I, I mark back so I like don't forget which is the back and which is the front because once you're done, you, you can't see where, where the, the linen was. You know, you don't see the linen anymore. So uh, and then it, will, then it will straighten out and then you have to let it um, rest for rest. For, I let it rest for a day or two. And then um, you you do a lot of sanding. So I sand. I start with like a like a like a 180, and then I do 230, then I do 330, then I do a hand uh, one, and you have to keep checking it in a raking light. And then I do like 400 to 600. Uh, I'll pass I'll pass this around anybody so people can see this wood. And then I have a, a panel gotten marked up a little bit. Here's one of my panels, the finishing panel. You can, you, you can feel the front. Um, don't worry about getting your hands on it. It's, uh, I can clean it if I ever decide to paint on it. So, uh, so that's, that's, the that's, the, that's the whole, that's what you go through with the panel. And that's why the whole, the whole egg temper world is in a tizzy right now because that company closed that makes the panels. Mm -hmm. And everybody's like asking everybody else. I had Michael Burke asking me if I knew <laughs> so I make mine. <laughs> so so there's the only people who are making panels with the correct gesso on it right now are uh, icon suppliers. And um, and they tend to be small. Sometimes they have like edges um, you know cut out of them. 
And, um, but there, there is a group on the same company, Natural Pigments on the West Coast, has developed, it, it is a, um, the jury's kind of still out on it. It's an acrylic based gesso, but that he has formulated so that it's absorbent enough that it will take egg tempera. And they're on aluminum panels, very lightweight. He makes them for oil, oil, I mean, you could get like big, panels for oil paint is really light like if you do big work and you have to ship them it's a, it's a great thing to try but um and um my 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 teacher you know tested them for him and she said they're they're like 80 percent there as far as handling goes uh, she's not sure about you know adherence you know over the long haul um they tend to be very very cautious so i don't think they put anything out that wasn't going to work but um, um, she said it, it, you, one thing with tempera, if your ground isn't correct, and even if it is the right ground, um, if you're not careful, if you work too, too long on, even though it's dry to the touch, the gesso underneath it, and the layers underneath you know, are damp. They, they, they don't dry fully for a, while, you know, for a while, and you can lift, you can lift off like, prior layers so um, so you know so you have to be careful but how long do you have to wait until gesso is completely dried oh but, uh, before you sand it I usually wait at least a day or two depending on how humid it is but usually within um, it dries pretty quickly so like when I put uh, like when you put a layer on uh, when you're you know priming your panel um, you can put the next layer on as soon as it's dry to the touch, and I alternate, like you know, you know, diff making my brush strokes go, di you know, different ways. You try to like, be especially on the front, you're trying to be very, very gentle and, you know, apply it smoothly so that um, you don't have uh, uh, air bubbles because you can create bubbles like while you're gessoing. So, uh, um, and then, uh, but usually within two days. Uh, it's ready for sanding, so it tends to dry very quickly. Yeah, it yeah. does. And we used to use it, and we still do, on canvas. Oh yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and and that, that's a, the great thing, you know. Like temper, you have to put a lot more layers on. But like, you know, if you're going to put a lay a glazing layer on, when I worked in oil, you know, if I put a glaze down, you have to wait 24 hours before you can put the next layer on when you're painting. You know, when you're painting, and. Um, and uh, gesso, you know, you just could put, put it on. <laughs> that, that was the thing. When I worked in oil, I was doing large, like four by six foot, you know, canvases, like whatever. And I, I did my own. I primed them. I stretched them. I, I used raw, raw cotton duck, and I, I primed them myself because I was doing detail work, and I, you know, wanted it very smooth. And I put like nine layers of gesso, and then I would sand it all down, and. Uh, so I'm used to all this kind have, of... Have you sanded down for your project after applying gesso? You have to have very fine um, sanding. Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. I, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. I go through like... Uh, mm -hmm. I go through um, like six different grits of sandpaper, you know, with the sanding block. And, um, and, and you have to like get all the brush marks out and some people want it much more smoother than, you know, others, other people aren't that concerned, but depends on the kind of painting they're doing. Yes. Like, you know, I tend to do, you know, very fine brushwork. I mean, tempera, tempera, you know, you can like splatter, you can, you know, but you can't, there's no such thing as impasto. There is no thick paint. It will crack right off. Yeah, yeah. But uh, people get texture, you know, they'll take toothbrush and, you know, do, to do rocks and, They'll, they'll drag things through it to like get wood grain, you know, I, I, I'm sort of crazy, but I just do it all. Because I want, the, I want it to all look like it be integrated, that's, you know, how I work. But, um, uh, but there, are, there are amazing things that, you know, that you can do. So some, some painters like just apply, um, like uh, Michael Burke, he only applies pure color, colors and, and he gets all of his colors by, you know, by the cross hatching and layering. Um, like he doesn't do a lot of mixing on the palette other than just tempering the paint. 
and then other people, I'll, I'll do a combination, you know, sometimes it's a pure pigment, sometimes it's mixed, so. So, so I'm going to um, demonstrate, you know, how I make the paint now. So does anybody, I, I have no concept of time, and I don't want to, I just want to know how we're doing. It's 4.15. Oh, okay, we got plenty of time. So, uh, I have a question. Um, during, in, during the Renaissance, what kind of ground do they use for the They used the same gesso that we're making now. It's in that book. That's where we got it. <laughs> yeah, that's how we knew. And I think people have tried to do other things, but like some people say you could use those ampersand clay boards, but the paint, it doesn't absorb the paint, you know? It, it like, it like moves around and it will eventually dry, yeah. So uh, I'm just gonna take these things. Oh, what did I do with my... I'm just gonna get a little reorganized here. So there's like so many different ways of, of separating eggs. And you're welcome to come up here and you can want to be able to see. So I just crack, crack my egg. And when people are watching me, I'm going to mess it up. So I will have to crack more than one. egg yolk, when I mix it with the water, will last me a couple of days. You can put it in the refrigerator. If it's really hot, um, you don't want to, um, I usually don't put it in my hand, but 
because I put the shells in there. <laughs> yeah. um, so now we have the egg yolk on here, but we on a piece of paper towel. So we just roll it around a little bit so we can uh, get the rest of the white off of it and so that I can pick it up more easily. And I have this little poker thing. You can just squeeze it usually. I mean, these are super, these are regular eggs. I usually tend to use like better better quality eggs, but I'm not working on a painting right now. I'm working on a drawing, so I didn't have any. But well, like pasture raised, and, you know, vegetarian fed, well, whatever they eat in the pasture, not necessarily vegetarian. Yeah, yeah. And they're nicer to the chickens. <laughs> I, I mean, I usually buy them, but they actually the supermarket didn't have them the, the week I bought these eggs. But um, some people, like when we do a workshop, sometimes like one of the people had their own chickens, they're bringing their own eggs. So the fresher, the better. So here I have like egg yolk, you know, in a little jar. Um, I brought some. I use distilled water because I just never know what's like in the water. Like, tons of chemicals and things. So. Um, and I don't use a lot of water, so I'll have, usually I'll have two, two little jars of, dis, of distilled water, one for putting in my paint, and one for uh, so that's my setup basically. But I'll show you a couple of samples of what I. Uh, Here's some pigments. These are some cool colors that you won't, you won't often see. This is called violet gray lavorite. I mean, it's some, some mineral that's dug up out of the ground. It's a beautiful smoky violet gray. And I, I use it a lot for like um, backgrounds. Oh, I'm sorry. Backgrounds. I'll sit down. <laughs> um, for, for backgrounds. Yeah. I'll move over here. Is that good? I just had to be away from that. Okay. So, um, and then here's another one. Um, pink pipestone. It's all catlinite. It's actually from the Southwest. There's only certain places in the Southwest that you get it. And it is, it, is, it contains clay. And um, it's actually what uh, Native Americans use to make their pipes. Um, if you, because when you, when you actually mix it with water and egg, it's like it, it turns like a kind of pale, like brick, brick kind of color. It's really, and you know, you, you get all these colors. They're very bad. They send you like little emails with this new color and blah blah blah. And they're and they're you know, it's not a mixed color. This is just that they, what they dug out of the ground. So um, I, I, there's a lot of ways to manage your pigments. Oh, and one more. This is one of my first batches of pigments that I bought. I bought these from Gamblin. So you can see there's like, there's about that much ultramarine blue. Now people, do, I, I know, I, I do pity people working in oil today because I'm looking at the prices of a tube of oil paint. Well, I bought this ultramarine blue 12 years ago and um, it's like, I'm still using it. And it probably cost me like 12 bucks. <laughs> so, uh, so egg temper is a very economical, because well, it's, it's applied so thinly and you can't do as many paintings. And, uh, but the, the biggest expense are the brushes. So, um, because you go through brushes like, like nothing. Because if you need, you need a point and you know, to do like this, this sort, uh, this the way I do it. And, um, and because of the nature of the of the gesso and the contents, you know, it, wear, it wears them out. But you know, a couple of brushes will will I get a whole painting done like with one of them. But that's like four months of you know a lot of work. So so and and basically, you know, I do have like you know a little molar here. Um, but um, most most pigments that you buy commercially today, you you don't really need. There are a few that you will find are more gritty, uh, like this. This one does need grinding if you're going to use it. I I rarely use it. I just bought it kind of for fun, uh, but um, 
and, and I, I use a lot of like the organic, um, and not or, not organic, but the, the the traditional earth earth colors. So this is a very limited palette that I just carry around for um, when I do demonstrations. But um, I have like four of these at, at home with like different, you know, I have the reds, the blues, and you know, and and different um, different ones. So. Um, so some people like just take the dry pigment and mix it with the yolk like as they go that can get kind of messy and that can be bad for even if it's like not uh, you know a carcinogenic um, you know element um, just having the dust breathing in the dust is an irritant over time and you can end up with problems so most most temper painters find some way to to cut that dust down a lot of them make what's called pigment paste and they'll spend like a day and they'll mix, they'll have these little jars with like screw caps and they'll, you know, put the pigment on here and they'll mix, you don't, you don't mix egg yolk with it, you mix just water with it until it's like the consistency of toothpaste and then you put it in that little jar and they, they put it on their palette or whatever they're gonna use, um, you know, as they do it. Um, I learned this from like another temper painter I just put the pigments in palettes so they're out you know I used to have to like I was working during the day I would come home at five o'clock and I wanted to be able to put my paint right out so I just put some droppers of water on this and it's just water and pigment but uh, the water keeps the dust down and it ends up being like crumbly um, you know crumbly watercolor so so when you when you mix the paint so when we mix the paint with the egg yolk medium, that's called tempering the paint. And that's where the term egg tempera comes from. You're just mixing the paint. You know, you're, mixing it at, you're mixing it as you go. Now, if, if people are working on a smaller, uh, on a smaller palette, um, uh, I mean, on, on a smaller piece, oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, they, um, they, you know, they'll, they'll want more colors out, you know, at a time, and so then they'll they'll mix like all their colors like for the day. Sometimes uh, you'll have like you know a, a little like porcelain thing with little wells in it, and they'll put all the colors in those, and you know have all their colors. But because I tend to work larger, sometimes you know I'm going to use like one color for like two hours. You know, in the meantime, all the paint dries out. So it's not like watercolor, like you have watercolor on your palette and it dries out and you can put more water on it. You can't do that with egg tempera. Once it's dry, it's dry. You have to scrape it off and that's it. So you either have to find a way to keep it wet and there are a lot of ways you can do that. Like, you know, we use a lot of egg droppers uh, to, um, you know, to keep, keep things wet. Yeah, or, or little spritz bottles or whatever. Although these tend to like, <laughs> they're too strong. <laughs> they like blow it across the thing. So this, this is the yolk, like straight, you know, straight egg yolk. Really, it's too thick to paint with. So what we normally do is we add some water to it. Um, I don't do quite, it's, it's a little bit less than 50-50, you know. Uh, I, I put a little less water. I like to get mine the consistency, like between heavy cream and Indian ink. And different people just like to work, um, you know. You, you'll just, experiment, people will experiment and, uh, work different ways. So I'm just going to add um, okay. And then you mix it up. Somewhere here I have a little So that's it. Now, if if you're gonna work, um, sometimes um, you know to get color down initially, um, we'll we'll mix paint a little thicker. We'll mix it on here, and we'll and we'll take a, a cosmetic sponge, and we'll like sponge over whole areas just to get some color to get a layer of color down. Because we're using the brush, it like can take forever. Then you might mix. You might need to make more paint for your sitting, you know, like I might use two eggs and, uh, you know, and, and that will go pretty quickly. But I'm at a point now where, um, you know, I'm, I'm not doing that. So for like, for this painting, 
this is an in progress still life, which, um, so what I did was I, I took like, uh, I did a whole layer of like violet gray, that sort of, you know, intermediate color uh, over the entire panel before I started and then I gradually, then I transferred my, oops, sorry, uh, transferred my drawing on there. So what I do is I, I have the tracing paper, um, you know, that my design is on and I, I make um, my own um, transfer paper, homemade transfer paper. Like you ever, and if anyone's ever used Sorrel, you know, it comes in sheets. It's like carbon paper for painters, but those colors are very, very strong, very, very difficult to cover up in egg tempera, no matter what color they are. So um, we just, we just, I take like heavy, that heavy tracing paper that I use, and then I mix pigment and alcohol and, and brush it on like, like, and I'll, I'll use like really more delicate colors, like like maybe a yellow ochre or a terra vert or something. Uh, and then I'll, I'll have like, a, I have a whole selection and it'll last me years, like once I, once I make them. And uh, because you don't always transfer the whole drawing on all at once. So, um, so what I'm gonna do is show you how, to, how I mix the paint. So the, the goal is to get 50% medium and 50% pigment. So, and then once you get that mix, you can add as much or little additional water as you like. So you can, you know, make it very transparent or not. Um, you know, you just, it just depends on what, what your goal is like at the time. So I just want to make sure that this is, I'm gonna, I have a little, here's a little, like a, a little thing that shows like the mark making, actually a friend of mine made this and gave it to me. So I didn't make this one, but it's, it's just nice to look at later. But I, I, have a, um, I have a little, like a little panel here, <coughs> show you some brushwork on. And I'll start out with, I usually use, we usually use watercolor brushes. Um, and you know, some people say, oh, we have to use Kalinsky, Series seven, whatever, blah, 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 $35 brushes, whatever. We, we've all tried them. We've all tried a whole lot of brushes and I've settled on, these are made by a company called Trekel and I like using synthetics anyway. I find they hold up better. And um, they're, they're, um, they're like, um, no, they're like, uh, no, they're watercolor brushes, yeah. So they're like, um, like, say, like sable, but they're synthetic but they're pointed rounds, so they're, they're very pointy. And they're really like, this is probably like $4, you know? They're, they're very reasonable, they last a long time, they hold their point, and um, they're, they're good. So I just wanna make sure that I have enough water in here. Yeah. You back off of the question that was asked earlier. Sure. I think the was, you know, what you material now to iterate after the process. Yeah, yeah you're crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. It, you know, it's like, I still remember in my, one of my first drawing classes at Pratt Institute, there was a, a teacher called Ted Kurahara, great drawing teacher, and he said, there's two ways of drawing. There's like jumping in and doing, you know, doing it and just getting it done. And then there is building it up layer by layer. And I'm one of those build it up layer by layer. Even when I did the abstract work, and I, I didn't realize this until over the years, you know, that's how I worked. When I did oil, you know, I did the drawing, I did the grisaille, I did the, the, the you know, the, the uh, glazes, layers and layers of glazes. And, this, it's a little annoying that, you know, I have friends who turn out a painting in a day, you know, abstract painters, like, oh, you know, they have more junk to get rid of now than I do. Or, or as you said, you sometimes have to go home and just paint. Right, right. Yes. Right, right. But now I'm like, um, but when I, when I want to just get something done, like I get an idea and I know it's, I'm not going to, so, so when I decide to do something, 
I had to be really sure I like it because I'm spending four months with it, you know. And that's sort of the process. And that is the process, yes. So, yes. Yeah. And it's very meditative. I mean, you just know. And there's always this stage, like, right in the middle where it's like, oh, my God, this is hot. You know, it's, I ruined it, you know, because, because the colors are all muddy and but you just have to keep, and I just have this little voice in my head. My teacher used to say, just tell yourself, you just have to do more layers. And, and then, and, and with temper, there's like a switch. Like when you're 70% done, all of a sudden it starts to look like something. And it's like, I don't know if any of you remember, uh, some of us remember, but I, I, I used to have one, uh, the, uh, those um, Kodak, uh, those instant cameras, what were those called? Polaroids, the, the Polaroid cameras. So the, 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 the picture would shoot out the, the back and, and it would sit and it would develop before your eyes. It's that, because you work over the whole surface on this, it's just like that. It's like, but it takes four months instead of like four minutes, <laughs> you know? So, and if anybody's interested, that's why a lot of this talk is about the materials and, and how to get there. And because watching someone paint an egg tempered painting is like watching grass grow. Um, but I'm gonna show you some, you know, how to handle the brush, how, how to mix the paint, you know, and it's, it's, it's you know, it's very, um, I listen to tons of audio books tons of podcasts because so you're alone like like all the time and but but it is like i i'm so now into like this routine like by the time i'm getting near to the end of like a painting i already am lining up the models for like the next painting and you know f figuring that all out and getting the panels ready and you know, that sort of thing. You know, I always have to like drive the wood over to my brother-in-law's house because he has a wood shop and he can cut the wood. <laughs> and there's all these like little rituals. But I did, when I decided to do this, you know, it's, I can't like show up and, and show my work to a gallery because they want like 20, 20 pieces in a year, you know? It's like, that's just never gonna happen. So I do like, you know, small group shows and you know that sort of thing but and, and at this age i want to be spending my time doing what i want to be doing with the time i kind of have left so like we can we sit around and i don't i don't teach yeah every once in a while i'll do a workshop i'll do a silver point workshop yeah i don't really have a space you know to teach and i used to teach like drawing and painting and anatomy and that sort of stuff in my home studio but I don't have that sort of space anymore where I am now. So um, that one took about five months, uh, and that's like twenty-five to thirty hours a week. So uh, because I, it was during the lockdown. I was still working, but I was working from home. And, um, yeah, yeah. So that was that was fun, and that and that was just the painting. That wasn't the composition or any of the other stuff because it took a long time for me to figure that out. And I think I even made a change. Um, sometimes I'll do the, the, the drawing, the initial drawing, and then I'll, um, you know, then I'll say, that doesn't, I would like to change that. And I change it before I do the painting, so. Um. How did you like the position? There's so much going on in there. Not just the layers of the Yeah, you know, the layers of the I just, it, that was like kind of like my natural gift. I could just, I could just do that from the time, even when I was a kid. I used to make things, you know, that way. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you can teach composition. You could give people rules and guidelines, but that's kind of kind of it. So I think this is ready ready to go now. So would it be better? I'll put these down the side here, so it'll be weird for me. But um, so where is my thing? paper towels? I have a very certain setup that I use when <laughs> I'm not in it. Okay. So I am going to mix up some yellow ochre here. It doesn't. No. Like, you might notice it. It might make your white look really warm, but once it evaporates out, it's gone. You know, you know it's really not. Um, yeah. But you see? You just just hung up your knee, okay? Yeah, yeah, you're trying to do like 50-50. Yeah. 
And it's really only because of practice, because there's no hard and fast rule. So it would look like more, but you have to allow for the height of it. Yes. Yeah. So now you have, you have that. Yeah. So I'm using, um, this is just like a marble slab. Um, it actually came with my rolling pin, but I never roll anything out on this, so I always use it as a palette. Uh, but you can, uh, people use glass, um, and, and other people, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll mix these little piles of paint, and then I don't know how they do it, but then they put it in a little cup. You know, if I keep it wet, like, a little longer, but, you know, I just, like, if I'm going to eat lunch, like, I'll put a little ring of water, because it dries from the outside in, so I put, like, a little drops of water around it, and it'll, you know, uh, it'll dry off. And, oh! Try to get out! <laughs> Sounds like my alarm clock. <laughs> okay. So, uh, we'll start with this, and I will... I will do this like right here. So I'm going to start with a large brush. So often I'll start with a large. Like this is considered a large brush. Oh, no. <laughs> but um, is tempera always done small brushes, or does it depend on the artist? It depends on the artist. Now some artists will take. I don't, I have one here with me. So like you know what you're doing is like you're, you're making like marks and you're cut. You go really quickly. But but I found these. These are called. I found these. And I tried this out. And it was really cool. They're called grainer brushes, and so they're like little flats, you know. But they but they've had like every like three hairs like taken out. So like you get like eight marks instead of one mark. So I did I did paint it with that. It covered ground. But it, the problem is is you can't you can't put on like a wash because it sinks in and dries so quickly. It's not going to go with, you know, it goes, it's almost like what you think fresco would be like, you know, going into plaster. So, uh, and I usually um, add, um, I usually add like a little water to my brush. Oh, and, and it's a dry brush medium. So you don't take it like this and put it on here. You wipe it. And then, um, well, let's say I'm going to do I probably should have done a darker color. And, and different artists have different approaches. So I, t I, t I follow the form. So you see my marks um, travel around. You know, they're going around the form. And you're working um, from dark to light. So the, the temptation is, is to use it like watercolor because you have this beautiful white, you know, panel and it glows and through and, but you really, that's, that's not the aim. And this is like a very, and, and you're not putting it on very thickly. And, and so what it, what it is, is like a back and forth and a back and forth. So this is, I'm applying this very transparently. And then, you know, then as I get um, farther, many, many layers in, okay, so I'm going to take some, uh, I'm going to take a little violet color here and mix a darker. I'm going to take a little of this, put it over there. One thing you have to be careful when you're, when you're working on a slab like this, your, your palette knives get really, really sharp. And you can very you can do bad cuts with them. <laughs> so. But I just added some paint there. So I have to get, you have to add the egg yolk to get, um, keep that ratio. I didn't add very much paint. 
Uh, in this day and age, is there a synthetic egg yolk, or is this really the... <laughs> um, uh, actually, <laughs> a friend of mine who is in the restaurant business said, oh, why don't you just use... I don't know. There, there is reconstituted egg yolk, but I don't know if it has the fat content, which is what you're looking for here. And since I only use egg like you know, one egg like every two or three days, it's you know I would rather just stick with the recipe. <laughs> also, you appreciate the process. Of yeah, the yeah, I know. So, uh, I'm an old fart, if, you know. Um, <laughs> so. if, if, if if somebody has, has done it, yeah. Yeah, and I haven't seen like, and I'm thinking there are a few painters that are trying to use egg to do egg like they want to do egg tempera. They want to say they're doing egg tempera but they want to do really large. Well, they can, but it's not going to look like egg tempera. It's going to look like poster paint. You know, that's what it's going to look like. Because the, the way you get this quality, the quality that you want, like sort of that kind of luminous kind of color, is by the layers, not by taking, you know, I know a woman, I, 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 she's a lovely woman, but she's like, she's like, using rollers with egg tempera paint to, just to make a six foot tall painting. And, um, but then you might take a layer like this. And normally I wear a, um, I wear a glove, which I left home. And I, I work on a turntable. See now, you get some dark in there. Well, you only really have to have the temperament. You do. Yeah. 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 You know, and I'm so glad that I didn't find someone to teach it to me when I was 21. Because I would never have stuck there. Yeah, right. I was like, get rid of this, you know? <laughs> it was like, uh, mm -hmm. So when you do an egg tempera painting, is it how you would be do a little piece at a time? Well, I'm just showing you this now. But, I know. But, but what I would do it. is, I probably would take a sponge, and uh, I'll show you what I would do with the sponge. I'll use this sponge because it's and kind of like, yeah. wipe it across. So, hmm. <clears throat> you have to you have to work on it though to get rid of all these little bumps and things. Who like the bumps? Yeah. Or, or, or do people do leave them? Yeah. Hmm. So and, and and you can do a scumble. So you can take like a white. Um, like sometimes you're working on a face, you know, a portrait, and like it's getting too rose. You know how you tend to like oh, make things too pink, you know. And you could take a scumble of a very thin veil of white, and and you can um, you know go over it and it'll cool it, knock it back, cool it down. It's a lot of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. When I do when I do a sky like like that sky, that sky looks great, but. You know, that is like, that would be a layer of pure, you know, a, a pure, like, pink ultramarine blue, watered down. And then a layer of, I have like a, an Armenian earth, like orange, um, a layer of that. And then I might, and that's just with, you know, with no white. And then I'll, I'll do it with white. And then I'll, then I'll mix the gray and do a layer of that. Then I might throw some violet in. It's layers and layers and layers, and it sort of gives it that sort of that quality. Um, and you know, different different painters, you know, do it do it different ways. So I'll sponge a lot on, um, and um, but and I, and I can even I can even do some work on this one. So because this is in progress, so I I'll use a smaller brush. But this this has so many layers. It has violet. Um, it has, um, I just love like rolls are like so like, you know, they glow, the golden glow of like bread. Yeah. <laughs> no, let's take this. These little things on. What color are you using? This, this is yellow over. Plain or Just plain. And you just have to keep moving. You can't hover because that's when you get that lifting problem that I was telling you about. And if you get a hole, what sometimes it'll go all the way through all the layers, and then you have to wait for it to dry, and you have to sort of replicate all the colors around it. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. It, it, some people just, it will make you run screaming from the room, right? Ooh. I don't want to put my horn in the paint here. <laughs> I understand being tedious on a stone carving. You can do so it. I oh, right. I carve marble. Oh, wow. Oh. You're giving me marble dust. Right. Did you have I guess you have to be very careful with the temperature. It depends. It depends on what you're doing. What yeah. details that you yeah. really want to yeah. include. He's a normal marble carver. He he worked at Pratt, but he he, he taught at Pratt, but he he worked at the Met. Mm. Um, he was he and his daughter Hohev, Vanessa Hohev and Bruce Hohev. They had a foundry, mm. but he was a marble carver. I've never done it, but I've, well, I, uh, well, that always appealed to me. I've never had a chance to try it. And, and mixing, there's things you have to watch out for. You know, you, you, you really, titanium white is the white that you use. You don't have a lot of other options. But, you know, you have to make sure things don't get chalky. Um, I just discovered something that my teacher said, try this, you know. I said, let's try this. It, it, they make a titanium box. So it's like a, like a very pale tan. Oh. And I'll use that for mixing flesh tones until I really want to get to the highlight. And it's, it's, I don't have any with me. Or maybe I do. I thought I had a little bag of it. Yeah, I think you have a little bag of it under that. Is that yes. Did you use it yeah, in No, I didn't oh, have one. Yeah, that's titanium buff. Oh. So I'm putting some of the violet on here, so. One of these days I'm actually going to finish this thing and I'll know what I'll do. <laughs> How long did you work on this before you started? You know, this, um, I've been working on this on and off for years now because I use it for when I do demonstrations. Yeah, because I don't really do still life. I'm, still life for me were kind of easy. So, um, but, um, and I do have a, um, I do have a um, silver point drawing of this, but I did it with that, it's the Golden's ground that they make, silver point ground, and I find it, it has a very narrow value, it, it yields like a very narrow value range, so I didn't like it, so, yeah, so, so, but um, that is kind of, and then, um, and then usually a, a, a little trick that you do is you, um, I leave, um, I let this dry usually overnight, and then I scrape it off with a razor blade because you can test, even now I like to test myself whether you're tempering your paint properly. So if it breaks up into little shards, it means you didn't have enough egg. But if it comes off in a continuous curl, uh, it's good. What if you had too much egg? And if it, it will tell you that, but you'll be able to, if you have too much egg, because believe me, I've done that, like especially with sponging, it stays tacky and sticky and it's gross. And you have to like wait like a couple of weeks for that to dry and then go then start again. So. And do you, do you have to remove it or? No, you can leave it. It will ultimately dry. And putting it out in the sun helps. It will like polymerize faster. Yeah. So, so, so that it's just is basically it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're ever going to do like I have on on the handout, there are people that do get workshops. Mm -hmm. um, usually, they're a week because you can't finish anything in less than a week. So. Um, but um, yeah, but, but you can get beautiful atmospheric effects. Mm -hmm. um, so like a lot of times, like I'll, I'll like, uh, the piece I just finished, you know, um, that's in the, the show that uh, that is up now. It, it's like a couple in the woods. It's called picnics, and it's all like.
like a, a forest, like you know, woodlands behind them. And it was just like too crisp, you know. So so I took this violet, this gray violet, mix it with a little white, and but you know, and I can do a glaze. When we talk about glaze, we're not talking, we're talking about with the tip of the brush. We're not talking about you know but I just can go very quickly. I did a whole, you know, knock the whole thing back. Like created, you can create mist. You could do awesome clouds. <laughs> you could do. Uh, it's great. A lot of botanical people like it. But you can also do beautiful portraits. Uh, the portraits. Uh, and I am not the best. I mean, I do a lot of figures, but there are people that do just amazing portrait work. It's like, um, because they just, they have control you know, over all the lights and darks. Does anybody know Julio Reyes? Um, he was an oil painter. Um, he shows at Arcadia in, in downtown. Um, he took up Ectempera. And he has a very different approach. He, he uses some kind of underpainting that he does, but then he uses a brush. His marks are much bigger. Oh. And, and I don't know what brush he's using, but he does workshops too. And his, but he has an amazing sense of light. They're all like kids playing in a swimming hole or whatever, beautiful reflections off the water. But his, um, his portraits are just amazing. So, so you can make yourself crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's a lot of the people I know. I mean, they're nine by 12 is about the largest mm -hmm. they go. But you I, make yourself crazy I in any uh, movie. I know, I know. And, and the hardest thing for me, as I said, was the scale. Get it? Because I was working, my figures are all life scale. Mm -hmm. And then coming down to this, because you just can't do them that yeah. hard. Yeah. Uh, my eyes are, are, are good, you know? I'm like, my eyes are all squinty now from doing this like 12 hours a day, whatever I do, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so you just do what, do what you can do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so wonderful. It's it's you know it, it's now you now you know <laughs> now you know why you didn't do it. <laughs> no, but but it's you know when you see these paintings and you don't know what goes into them, and it it sounds like everything is like such a big deal. You know, once you learn the pattern making process, or you find somewhere to buy them. You know, that's the hardest, that's the messiest thing. You, you just sit down and paint. And, and some people are okay with leaving it. You know, like not finishing it as much as I do. Some people tend to do, treat it like watercolor, where the, the lights are um, really a lot of the, and the, the panels showing through, you know. So, um, but I, I like to have a little more paint on than that. So, yeah. Okay, that's great. Let's be back there. Now I'll take you to tomorrow and pack it up.